So this next section, we're gonna be talking about leaf energy balance. And for the first part of this course, we've really been thinking about ecology from a community perspective, sort of a 30,000 foot view of what this landscape looks like, how these species are interacting. But just in this last section, as we considered soil type, we started to look now, instead of thinking about how uh, space influences organism, what organism can tell us about space. And so we looked at the leaves of backers and used that to tell us something about um, the abiotic factors present in that system. And this gets us into an area that is called physiological ecology. And it's a lot of the work that I do um, in my research. So I wanna talk a little bit about the value of physiological ecology and why it's important, especially for conservation. So here again is uh, the marine headlands uh, areas where I work in studying grassland and shrub encroachment uh, in native habitats. And one of the challenges with conservation, so I worked for years uh, doing removal of sometimes native species, sometimes non-native species to affect grassland habitats that would look like uh, what they had in historical times. One of the challenges is we don't have a good baseline to work from. So we have photos that show uh, these landscapes looking grassy and without any scrub encroachment. We have also records from early California uh, botanists like Alice Eastwood and Clement who surveyed these landscapes and said, yes, this is dominated by grassland systems. But as it turns out, those landscapes were essentially already impacted by 150 to 200 years of Spanish ranching that had already modified this space. So as a result, we don't have a good way to know what the landscape looked like historically and when, we're, and when trying to affect restoration on the landscape, we don't have necessarily a good idea of what would be the most effective or sustainable or functional system to plant and model our restoration around. Grassland systems, unlike forests, especially the redwoods, tend to be pretty ephemeral. We don't have old growth forests. We don't have old growth uh, baccarat stands. So there's not a lot that we have to go off of. Because of that, it's kind of like when you do a restoration project, it's kind of like uh, trying to build a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, without having a picture of the box to work from. But there's an added complication, which is that because of invasive species, because of local extinction or other factors introduced by humans, we also are sort of contending with a puzzle that has maybe not all the pieces, and where maybe we've also mixed in pieces from an entirely different puzzle. So if you're going to try and solve a jigsaw puzzle with those limitations, what you'd want to do is you'd want to look at where the edge, edge pieces are, you'd want to look at the color, you'd want to look at the shape and start to sort your pieces accordingly, rather than just trying to get a sense of that landscape, trying to get a sense of that puzzle, simply based on where the pieces fell when they came out of the box. And so that's what we do with physiological ecology is we look at individual components of species, their attributes, their proclivities, um, and use that to get a sense of what sorts of restoration goals function around those limitations and uh, attributes of the plant we're studying. So a place I really want to start then is thinking about leaf tissue. And leaf tissue is fundamentally important to this conversation because when we look at plants and we look at California from that 30,000 foot perspective, California is green. And whatever system you go to, you'll find that green tissue is what is driving the conversion of the sun's rays into energy that then drives photosynthesis. And so in thinking about this, we need to start with leaves and then thinking about leaves, this is a question that very much comes back to the patterns that we saw with radiation and how leaves receive that radiation. So it's very much a question of climate, both micro and macro. So recall that we've discussed how hemisphere and latitude of California will influence our macro climate, where we are with respect to the sun throughout the year, the angle of the earth, um, the season, we can also think at a closer scale. So here where I am on Berkeley, um, the topography, are there buildings that are reflecting sunlight or casting shadow? Is there canopy cover? Uh, how is hill slope influencing uh, incoming radiation? What about altitude? So that informs a microclimate. But then we get to something that's almost a, a nanoclimate, which is the leaf itself. So that speaks to angle of leaf, texture of leaf, size and shape. And all this goes to inform something that we call uh, leaf temperature. And you may be wondering why leaf temperature has any importance here when the resources that a plant needs are going to be sunlight, they're going to be water, they're going to be nutrients. Well, as it turns out, leaf temperature is incredibly important because of delicate enzymes that exist within the leaf tissue, uh, in particular, rubisco. And so rubisco only performs between a narrow range of about 15 and 30 degrees centigrade. And rubisco is vitally important because it's the first step in catalyzing 
uh, photosynthesis. If the enzyme gets too warm, it can denature, break apart, no longer be functional. If it's too cold, it could be sluggish and also uh, disintegrate. We have to realize, though, that our environment is not always, though, between 15 and 30 degrees centigrade in California. We have very cold temperatures in the winter in some places, very hot temperatures in other areas. So we need to think about how the plant will go about regulating these temperatures in order to affect photosynthesis and respiration. And that brings us to this big complex formula uh, outlined by Erlinger and Dawson in 1989. And essentially, it is the leaf energy balance equation that stipulates that energy in should be the same as energy out. So if you watched Chernobyl on Netflix, um, you basically saw that as soon as energy uh, that was leaving that system was not the same as what was coming into that system, you had a nuclear meltdown. That's not something we would want to see, right, with our grass. You can imagine that, uh, or other plant, you can imagine that if you went to, say, AstroTurf on a hot day, that AstroTurf might be very, very hot, and yet a leaf uh, could remain cool even on 100 degree temperature. And that's because there's a regulation of what energy is being acquired versus what is being uh, re-radiated, convected, and transpired into that system, and all these terms I'm going to cover. So I know that showing an equation like this can be a bit daunting, especially for folks who are not math people. I'm not a math person. That's why I went into ecology. I especially don't like math when there's more letters than numbers, but I want to kind of briefly cover what these terms mean so then we can think about what they look like in the field, and I think you'll find it's actually pretty accessible. So our term to the right side of our equation, the absorbed radiation of our leaf. This includes things like absorbed radiation that is active for our plant to digest uh, for photosynthesis. That's what our term A means. And then also that's gonna be affected by that angle of the leaf. Just like we talked before about how the angle and aspect of a hill slope or the planet Earth with respect to the sun will influence how much radiation is received. So too will the angle of the leaf tissue. And then on that similar vein, uh, if that light is being received directly or indirectly by the leaf, maybe bouncing off a building or uh, through a canopy, will also influence um, how much radiation is being absorbed. Also, what comes to the sun is not just light that we can see and light that a plant can use for photosynthesis, but it's also going to be thermal radiation. So that includes then a term of emissivity, which is an absorption coefficient for thermal radiation, and then also all that other thermal radiation that exists in our system and is being re-radiated from our system. So I want us to first think about those absorption coefficients and what that looks like. So let's think about then what we're seeing as radiation comes in from the outside environment and reaches um, our leaf tissue. So we call this shortwave radiation from 100 to 250 nanometers. That area of one to 400 uh, nanometers, that's UV light. Fortunately, most of that gets screened out by uh, the atmosphere. So we have the ozone layer to thank for that. Then we've got this area from 400 to 750, which is called visible. That's what our eyes can see. Um, other critters can, of course, see outside of those bands of wavelengths, but that's what our eyes see. It just so happens that those wavelengths pretty closely match up with what we call PAR, or photosynthetically active radiation. So that's what plants are making use of. And then near infrared is all of that long, longer waved radiation that is um, essentially heat. And so for both uh, visible and also near infrared radiation, we're talking about wavelengths that are essentially cut out by things like clouds and aerosols and other things in our atmosphere that reduce what actually is reached, reaching our plant. So let's see what our plant is actually making use of. And so of all that radiation that the plant receives, uh, most of the UV radiation is not being absorbed. Most of the near infrared is also being shunted away from the plant. And then we're making use mostly of the visible spectrum. So about 60 80% of that which is being received by the plant is being made use of. Notice that there's this dip in that area where it's green. So that grayed out area is what we're making use of. That green is what we're not making use of. When you look at a leaf, it appears green. It is reflecting green light, right? And so that's what we're seeing is the light not being made use of by our plant tissue. So then I wanna talk about that direct and diffuse element. So you can imagine that some plants may be in full sunlight, but other plants may be in the canopy of a forest. And so the light they receive may be filtered um, through layers of foliage. If you're even a leaf that's just uh, not as close to uh, the canopy, but is maybe closer to the trunk of the tree, you may also experience less direct sunlight. So there's gonna be a filtering effect that will uh, lead to less light that is direct, intercepting most of our plant tissues. And plants will also, uh, in those full exposed leaves, 
uh, create modifications to also limit light exposure. We can look here at a lupin on the top right. It's using hairs that help to diminish that light exposure, just like hairs on your head can prevent you from getting a sunburn on your scalp versus areas of your body that have less hair, more likely to get a sunburn. So too, we see that with, um, with these leaf hairs. But plants don't have to use hairs to uh, diminish that direct light. You could also use waxes and other coatings. So here we can see um, a red cedar that has this waxy coating. It's almost like sunscreen blocking some of that light from being absorbed, changing what we call albedo, so reflectivity that allows for less heat to be absorbed and essentially to be reflected. And then the aspen is an interesting example because quaking aspen, the leaves tend to shimmer. And it's sort of like when you have a pancake and you flip it so it doesn't burn, those leaves are constantly shimmering in the breeze, so they're never too long in that direct sunlight. Let's also think about leaf shape. So if you look at something like a maple leaf, you'll notice that there's all these dissections. There's kind of these inlets, which we call um, uh, these dissections, these, these sinuses, and then these areas that extend, these peninsulas, which we call lobes, sort of like a lobe of your ear. Um, and so Imagine that I was going to throw you um, a basketball. So if I threw a basketball to you, you'd probably catch it with your fingers held wide, right? You wouldn't hold your fingers tight together. And so we often think of leaves that develop in shady conditions as being larger in size as a way to maximize the light that you receive. But one drawback from this is that if you have a larger leaf, you have to also maintain that leaf. There's overhead costs associated with building a bigger leaf. So what a tree like this is doing is it's extending that tissue out further, just like we might extend our fingers to catch a basketball. And in that way, we are maximizing our interface with the environment around us, maximizing our potential to absorb that dappled light as it trickles down through the canopy. Also, when we have this dissection, it allows us to have more interface with the environment around us, so more opportunity for gas exchange. Recall that leaves are where not only are we performing photosynthesis, but in order to do so, we have to access CO2. It'll be internalized and coupled with water to produce sugar, which is our battery for housing energy. So looking at Quercus, which is the genus for um, oak trees here in California, you can actually see that there's an interesting distinction between deciduous and evergreen oak trees. Our deciduous oak trees have lots of this lobing, lots of this dissection. Our evergreens do not. And so here we can see that there's more interface with our deciduous trees between the environment and the leaf tissue, which means more opportunity for gas exchange, more opportunity for photosynthesis. And they need that because those leaves are only gonna be in the tree for a brief period of time. Again, notice that there's some discolorations or variation in color between these leaf tissues, such as our blue oak, our Quercus de glacia. And so, Looking at that, that tells us again about how the effects of leaf color can also help to mitigate uh, incoming solar radiation. We can also think then about texture and thickness in addition to color. So here you can see two Arctostaphylus, both uh, are manzanitas. I found them growing in the Sierras in close proximity to one another. So they have essentially the same environment, and yet they've adapted, even while of the same genus, in very different ways to that space. So again, we can see that there's variation in color, which means that that lighter leaf may be more reflective of heat uh, than that greener leaf, Arctostaphylus patula. Notice that there's something in common. Both leaves are very thick. So if we look back at the uh, leaf that we saw from our maple tree with those dissections, we saw a lot of light coming through that tissue. We don't see light coming through these leaves. So instead of trying to catch a basketball, here this is sort of like trying to catch a baseball. And you can imagine if you're in the outfield of um, Oracle Park, you're trying to catch that baseball and it's coming to you at 75 miles per hour, you want some sort of cushioning, right? You want a baseball mitt. And so having thicker leaves, it helps to cushion from the impact of direct solar radiation. It helps for more absorption of that light because it's only experiencing strong direct sunlight. And therefore, it's going to need more tissue to catch and dissipate that energy as it moves through the leaf. And also in having that thicker tissue, we also protect sensitive machinery. We can also see here some texture elements as well. So our Arctostaphylus muweka has more spotting hairs, not quite evident in this image, but they're present and that also helps with diffusing light. But something else that's really important here is the angle of our leaves. So muweka tends to have its leaves in many different angles with respect to the sunlight, but Arctostaphylus patula, if you see it growing in the wild, those leaves are almost always directed vertically so that at the noon day, when the sun is most intense, we have the most solar radiation, heat, and also both of the reactive radiation, the light is striking just the edge of the leaf tissue rather than the flat pads. And what that means is we put those flat pads essentially in shade 
at midday and thereby reduce um, direct solar radiation to our leaf tissue. So another really important strategy then for regulating temperature and intercepted light, which we refer to as cosine I or leaf angle. And here's a nice example from the redwood forest. You can see that um, it appears like the ones in the sun are starting to wilt, but the oxalis oregana in the sunlight, they're actually just crimping in their leaves so that they have a more oblique angle to the sunlight, whereas those in the shade have let their leaves be flat at what we would call zero degrees with respect to um, the surface in order to maximize the indirect sunlight that they are receiving and making use of. So let's think about the other side of the equation, re-radiation, convection, transpiration. And I think a way that I like to think about this is essentially these characterize the differences between a passive heat loss and a more active heat loss, with re-radiation being more passive, transpiration more active, and convection sort of this middle ground between those two forms of heat loss. So if you're thinking about re-radiation, essentially we're talking about something called passive or sensible heat loss. Uh, you've experienced this if you've ever touched a hot pan. Basically, if two things are of different temperature, uh, when they come in contact, they ultimately will ultimately will equilibrate and the temperature will even out between the two objects. And so that is essentially all that re-radiation is speaking to with a leaf tissue. Notice in this picture, this thermal image of, of leaves, we see at those more fine dissected leaves at the tips, they're a little bit cooler in temperature than the uh, center parts of the leaves. So this tells us a little bit more about what we talked before about with um, dissection of leaves and exposure to environment. So when you have more exposure, more interface, you more rapidly come in equilibrium with that surrounding environment. And the effect that this has ties then into this idea of convection. So here's a photo of um, not a leaf, but a airfoil in a wind tunnel with smoke that was added. I think this picture was taken in the 40s. It was commonly a way to show aerodynamics of of cars and, and airplane wings and things like that, you can see these eddying currents behind that uh, shape. And those eddying currents are essentially speaking to an envelope of air that's trapped around that uh, material and also speak to a recirculation of air within that space, such that we create a boundary between, in this case, an airplane wing, but in our case, a leaf and the outside environment. All right. And so we refer to that as leaf boundary layer. And essentially the leaf boundary layer is greater the more area we have to our leaf, the more hairs and textural complexity we add to our leaf. And the smaller uh, the leaf is, the more dissection we see, the smoother that leaf is, the less boundary layer that we experience. So a similar, an, an analogy for this might be if you uh, walked into a field on a windy day versus walked into a forest, you would experience more still air more consistent humidity in that forest than you would experience uh, in the field. And yet even still in that field, you would still have a boundary layer. If you just laid down the tall grass, you would experience close to the ground, still air and possibly a different temperature and humidity. So that's what we're experiencing then with this convection forces and boundary layer that we experience on our leaves. And then finally, uh, I wanna, well, before, I, before we get to our last point, which is transpiration, I wanna also just show, um, some examples of that. So you can see here with Lupinus arboreus, um, hairs on the leaf, which are essentially capturing and trapping, in this case, water droplets, but you can also imagine that they're capturing and trapping um, air on that leaf. And notice also the, the fold of this leaf. So that's also creating um, a leaf angle that can affect um, a more oblique interception of solar radiation and also will lead to more diffuse light. And then an example of our redwood. So a redwood may be anywhere from zero feet, if it's a seedling, to 300, maybe even almost 400 feet tall. That means there's an incredible variation in climate across that, across that height. And we can see here in our needles, change in boundary layer that will affect change in leaf temperature. So at those lower leaves, where it's more regulated in temperature, humidity is consistent, temperature is cool, we see the leaves are outspread. This is also a way to maximize access to light. But as we go up in the canopy where it gets cooler or hotter, we are trying to now have a leaf that is designed to be more consistent with uh, the body of the plant in terms of temperature regulation. So you can imagine on a cold day, you might pull in your extremities close to you to try and preserve body heat. That's basically what we're seeing here at 300 feet off the ground. All those little uh, parts of the, of the needles have been pulled in towards the branch in order to 
maintain a more consistent uh, temperature of that leaf if, say, we were experiencing snow or very hot weather that would lead to rapid um, radiation change and re-radiation between environment and leaf temperature. So transpiration is the last part of our equation. Transpiration is, of course, important for gas exchange. We need these things called stomata, which are these donut-shaped things uh, in the picture at uh, right, in order to allow for gas to enter our leaf so that we can perform photosynthesis. Also, we're gonna need transpiration for respiration. So plants respire just like uh, animals do. When you exhale, CO2 leaves you, but so too does water vapor. So the act of transpiration will also mean the loss of water, which can be stressful for a plant. But at the same time, transpiration also provides for a way to regulate heat loss in much the same way that a swamp box cooler or you sweating allows for regulation of heat loss. And what we're doing is we're playing off of um, the differences in uh, heat capacity of a liquid like water versus um, air. And so through this method, the plant is able to lose heat to the atmosphere. A caveat then is because we have that boundary layer, that boundary layer acts as a second uh, mechanism to slow moisture loss from the leaf by again affecting an envelope of air around that tissue and preventing um, moisture from simply wicking away too quickly from the leaf tissue. And the leaf can also adjust um, uh, transpiration by changing the aperture of those stomata to either prevent uh, gas exchange or enable gas exchange. And all this then speaks to uh, what will ultimately uh, be considered um, the heat loss through um, this evaporative forces. So when we start to put these together, we can get a sense then of what our plant is doing and how it's best designed for the environment in which we find it in. And I've included resources that can allow you to get accurate measurements of leaf size, uh, leaf temperature, and texture, and also a spreadsheet that can allow you to play with these different variables to get a sense of how when you manipulate different leaf variables or you manipulate different um, parameters of your environment, you can see different effects in terms of transpiration rate, leaf temperature, uh, or cosine i, and the other variables that we identified in this lecture. And I'm going to turn things now over to Amy for our uh, questions.